So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Honors Lecture Series here on uh, November 5th. Uh, is that our date? I believe so. Uh, our fall lecture series, fall 2018. And uh, we're mighty pleased today to have Dr. Ron Bombardi, who is the chair and professor of the MTSU Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, who's speaking to us today. I'm Dr. Mary Evans. I'm resident faculty in history here at the University Honors College and I help facilitate for Dean Philip Phillips um, the fall lecture series this year. Dr. Bombardi earned his PhD in philosophy from Marquette University in Mil Milwaukee, Wisconsin back in the 1980s, and he did his dissertation at that time on empirical foundations of clinical psychology, which initiated a series of interdisciplinary studies in the history and philosophy of modern science that still characterizes the tenor of his contemporary work today. For the last 30 some odd years, he's been teaching logic and philosophy here at MTSU, where he is now indeed a full professor and chair of the department. During his tenure here, he's delivered numerous papers and given lectures here at the Honors Lecture Series. Uh, he has directed Honors Theses and he's taught many Honors classes at MTSU as well. His recently published work uh, includes work on metaphysical realism, the neurobiology of truth, and in his love of music, race, class, and gender in American vernacular music about the blues. His talk today for the Honors Lecture Series on Governors concerns governance and the pursuit of liberal democracy. He will be discussing the political theory of the 17th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza, a figure Bombardi routinely teaches in his MTSU course on the history of modern philosophy, which just happens he will be offering spring semester here on the first day of early course registration. Um, so I present to everyone about tulips, torts, and Torah governance and the pursuit of liberal democracy in the Dutch golden age. Dr. Ronald Bombardi, thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Your kind attention is much appreciated. Thank you, Mary, for that lovely introduction. And uh, thanks to John Vile and the Honors Program and Philip Phillips for inviting me today to come and address you all. It's, uh, it's a very special day, actually, for me to be addressing the topic that I'm going to uh, put before you today, being the 5th of November. You know to remember the 5th of November? The gunpowder treason. The gunpowder treason. This was uh, on this day in, in 1605, some... Uh, some Catholics who were a little bit uh, displeased with the figure of James I, the King of England, decided that the best course of action to return England to a, uh, a Catholic monarchy was to take the old fellow out. And they decided to blow him up on the first day of Parliament, which would have been in February, except for the plague, and so it was going to be held in November. We remember this day in England as Guy Fawkes Day, because he was the character who was in the basement waiting to set the gunpowder alight and blow up the parliament. Uh, this was a failed um, effort, and there's a long story there. If you'd like to hear a little more of that story, I can tell you about that a little bit later. But because this was an instance of, of, of sectarian violence, it's an especially appropriate day for me to be addressing you on the topic I have before us. In England, right now, it's kind of dark. And all over the city of London, there are bonfires burning the effigy of Guy Fawkes to remind the English of the effort to commit regicide on behalf of the uh, Catholic faith. So we'll want to kind of bear that in mind as, as, as I talk you through the topics I have in mind with respect to Baruch Spinoza. So my talk today is about the history of an idea. Right? It was just one single idea. It was an idea that surfaced in the Dutch Republic in the year 1670. It swept through the intelligentsia of modern Europe, and it earned its progenitor, the philosopher Baruch Spinoza, a vicious appellation. He was called a renegade Jew for his having written a book that was deemed by the Provincial Synod of South Holland to be as obscene and blasphemous a book as the world has ever seen. Now this book, comprising about 20 chapters, first appeared in, in, it first appeared in Quarto in January of 1670, 
and it bore the title Tractatus Theologico Politicus, which is typically Englished as the Theological Political Treatise, the Theological Political Tractate. Um, sometimes it's just referred to as the Treatise, and I will sometimes refer to it simply as the TTP for Tractatus Theologico Politicus. It was originally published without any authorial attribution, but by early June of the same year, various cognoscenti across Europe were well aware that it had been penned by Spinoza, who was at this time only known in philosophical circles as the author of a commentary on René Descartes' 1644 Principles of Philosophy. Now Spinoza's treatise contains a veritable panoply of what in the day must indeed have been among the most temerarious postulates and inferences ever to appear in print concerning religion, politics, the rule of law, and the freedom to philosophize in a modern liberal state. Now in what follows, I shall discuss a number of these postulates and inferences, but the idea to which I wish to direct your primary attention as we work through the course of Spinoza's treatise and especially as regards the theme of this year's Honors Lecture Series on Governors, is this. Spinoza's contention that sectarian religion constitutes the single most dangerous threat to the peace and security of any civil society. In the TTP, Spinoza defends this idea by way of three perspectives. Political theory, commentary on ancient Hebrew scripture, and reflections on contemporary affairs in the Dutch Republic of his day. Now I will examine each of these perspectives in the course of this talk, after which it will be my contention that Spinoza's idea concerning the dangers posed to liberal democracy by sectarian religion is one that has not outlived its pertinence and its usefulness. So what is this idea about the pernicious effects of sectarian religion on the pursuit of liberal democracy got to do with tulips, or torts, or the Torah? Well, my answer to you is that I intend them as kind of hermeneutical or interpretive exhibits. They're ways that we can best understand why Spinoza came to write the positions that he did within the historical context in which he lived. Many things that were true of the Dutch Republic are not that unfamiliar to us, but some aspects of it are, and so in order to see how he argues and why he argues the way he does, it'll be very helpful for us to get a good sense of the historical context before I turn your attention directly to the political theory. When Spinoza was just turning four years old, he was a resident of Amsterdam, and in November of 1636, the soaring Dutch economy of that period saw an enormous financial bubble in what would come to be called tulip mania. It's not unlike the dot-com bubble in some recent memory here. That bubble burst in February of 1637. All right, so between November of 36 and February of 37, that bubble got so big that it burst. And the causes that led to the collapse of the tulip market and the repercussions that followed well, it turns out they had as much to do with Dutch politics as with the rise of the mercantile class, of which Spinoza was soon to become a member. The story of tulip mania can accordingly tell us in microcosm a good deal about how Spinoza understood the nature of political economy. And in the fledgling liberal democracy of his day, this political economy was a brand new enterprise. Strangely enough, it can also tell us a good deal about the political and economic aspirations of both the governors of the Dutch Republic and the Calvinist theologians who presided over the Dutch Reformed Church. Now the Dutch Republic into which Spinoza was born was a newly minted sovereign state. It was formally forged in the first decade of the 17th century as a union of the seven Calvinist provinces known as the Northern Netherlands or the Northern Lowlands, after nearly a hundred years of struggle for independence from the domination of Catholic Spain. We should never lose sight of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to bring this to our attention several times. Now, in this period there, at the beginning of the 17th century, the great port cities of Amsterdam, Harlem, and Delft rose in prominence with the formation of various trading companies, not the least of which 
was the Dutch East India Company, we, we refer to it as the VOC, which was a veritable mega corporation. It had instituted monopolies as a result of state intervention. It was instituted formally in 1602, three years before the gunpowder plot. And it would long, it, before long, it would come to control a vast network of international and commercial enterprises. And it had its own army. It established its own colonies. It was uh, largely responsible for the exportation of uh, 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 Dutch, the sensibilities of Dutch rule throughout the world. Now, in turn, the administration of the Republic was peopled by the wealthy merchant class, with oligarchical alliances replacing the Burgundian landed aristocrats who had hitherto ruled the Netherlands. These oligarchies proved to generate enormous fortunes, and with the vast accumulation of all this new money came new financial and economic practices as well as new cultural interests in exotica of all kinds, including a compelling fascination with tulips, which is something we still find true of the Dutch world today. Now, originating in the valleys of the Qin Shan Mountains, which mark the boundary between China and Afghanistan, tulips had been highly favored by the sultans of the Ottoman Empire for over 500 years before Dutch traders began to import them for sale to the ascendant merchant class whose passions and predilections shaped the cultural contours of the Dutch Golden Age. And Dutch botanists like uh, uh, Carolus Clusius of Leiden University, uh, or Leiden University, soon discovered that while growing tulip bulbs from seed required seven to twelve years before they would flower, as I'm sure most of us know, a bulb alone can flower again the very next year. All the same, tulips only bloomed for about a week during the months of April and May, at least in the northern hemisphere. Now between June and September, the plant is dormant, and the bulbs can be uprooted. They can be packaged, and they can be sold. During the rest of the year, however, tulip traders signed contracts. They, would, they signed these contracts in which they would agree to buy tulips at the close of the season. And these were what we would today call futures contracts. And I want you to be thinking carefully about what it means to buy a futures contract. You promise in the future to buy something once it becomes available. Right? Now, during the first four years of Spinoza's life, the tulip trade had reached a feverish pitch. Prices for the most prized bulbs, which were called broken bulbs, because they sported striped multicolored petals, um, instead of the typical single colors that we often see today. And these were actually caused by a virus. You had to infect the plant with a virus in order to get it to, uh, to be broken and to display these beautiful stripes. Well. It grew to a point where these things became so valuable that a single bulb was set to fetch a return of the equivalent of the yearly earnings of a skilled artisan, like a silver worker, right? someone who would hammer out silver plate, the, the amount of money that person could make in a year, or a painter like Vermeer, right, would have been the value of a single bulb as that bubble got greater and greater and greater, and they became more and more valuable. Prices rose because the futures contracts could be bought one day, and then they could be sold on the, on the next day on the open market. They could be sold later in the day for a handsome profit. At the height of the mania for acquiring these tulips during the winter of 36-37, some contracts were reported to have changed hands as many as ten times in a single day. And each sale increased the value of that contract. But by February of 1637, the bubble burst, the market collapsed, and like dominoes falling one over the other, the traders began to default on their promises to procure bulbs at the prices to which their contracts had committed them. Now, this crisis right, <laughs> it caused a worse crisis. Right? The crisis that ensued was basically an erosion of trust. And the Dutch were not used to this at this point. They had been following along in this practice. These were the first people to issue actual stock, 
the first people in, in the Western tradition to create stock in, in, in a company and sell it on the open market to anyone who had enough money to pay for a, a portion of the company. This would have been the VOC to the, uh, the Dutch East India Company. Well, this erosion of trust was in fact actually easy enough to forecast after the Dutch Parliament decreed that very month that all futures contracts would be reinterpreted as options contracts. So futures that were signed after November 30th of 1636 were now to be interpreted as options, thus relieving the buyer of legal responsibility to purchase tulips at the contractual price provided that the buyer instead compensated the seller with a fixed 3.5% of the original price. All right, so you only had to give the, the person, well, 3.5% of the original contractual price. And then you were relieved of legal responsibility to purchase things uh, as a future contract would have committed you. So the Dutch Parliament had effectively promulgated a form of risk-free speculation. That's what they wound up doing. And that accordingly drove the contract prices skyward. Eventually, as the market imploded, the government was forced to halt trading. And it just wouldn't let them trade anymore until the contracted value of the tulip bulbs started to approach an equilibrium with the intrinsic flat value of the flowers themselves. Now, this has been written up in a lot of 19th century history as one of the great instances of decline in, uh, uh, in all of economic history from the beginning of time to now. But was the crisis really all that bad? As the tales of economic ruin say, right? Or is it the tale of a poor sailor who was incarcerated for ingesting a tulip bulb that he confused with an onion? This appears, the story appears in a recent movie called Tulip Fever. And if you ever see, if you see this film, you'll see some beautiful Dutch interiors and some very nice uh, uh, video of what the period would look like. And um, if you're looking at cell phones, you could look it up instead of not having a PowerPoint here. I just let you use your imaginations, or you can look this up. Well, this story actually never happened. Nor did it happen that day laborers were slipping into the market in hope of scoring riches. People who invested these things were professional traders. So, no, it wasn't as bad as all that. In fact, the damage to Dutch financial institutions was actually relatively minor. So how then did this exaggerated picture of a crisis, of a calamity of enormous proportions take hold of the Dutch imagination? And the answer turns out to implicate the interests of sectarian religious authorities the Calvinist clergy, who saw in the frivolous consumption of strikingly beautiful flowers the seeds of moral decay. And in their concerted effort to combat this decay, to ameliorate this decay, they produced an outpouring of propaganda, all sorts of pamphlets decrying the collapse of the tulip market as divine punishment for the ungodly greed to which the citizens of the Dutch Republic had succumbed. So most of the stories of ruin that we hear among the ordinary people, right, day laborers, sailors, and so on, were completely fabricated. So Calvinist theology, according to its devout adherents, dictates an understanding of political economy as subject to divine law. And that's one of the major uh, uh, features of Spinoza's worries about the nature of sectarian religion over against liberal democracy. But on the contrary, it was humanly codified. It was earthbound, positive law, right? the legal transformation of futures contracts into options contracts that led to the collapse of the tulip market. The edict that promulgated this transformation spawned the massive erosion of trust among traders, and it culminated eventually in widespread economic and financial injustice. Injustice is, of course, the stuff of tort law. So it is to tort law that I will turn next as my second exhibit for contextualizing Spinoza's treatise. 
So toward law and the efforts of the Dutch parliament to wrestle with the new economic realities of a nation state founded on principles of liberal democracy and whose wealth almost entirely depended on trade is my next exhibit. Now the story here can tell us much about what Spinoza's contentions in the treatise were and what they were designed to protect from the threats of sectarian religion. With, and, and pretty much the sectarian religions with which he was most familiar, Judaism and Christianity. Now, toward law concerns civil litigation in which a plaintiff alleges having suffered an injury or a harm due to the actions or omissions of a defendant. The term tort comes to us, well, came into Old English, right, or Middle English, rather, from the Old French for injury, and it was derived from medieval Latin tortum. Medieval Latin tortum derives from classical Latin tortus, for twisting. And you may note that it is also right, the origin of the word torture. Right? So tort law concerns injury that would come from twisting and wrangling and putting you on the rack and things of that kind. So it comes from that notion of an injury. Right? So it came from medieval Latin, and it first appeared in Anglo-Dutch usage in the late 16th century. So it doesn't really get used until around then. Now, tort law stands in familiar contradistinction to both criminal law on the one side and contractual law on the other side. Contract law uh, uh, is, is, is separated out from tort law. So in criminal law, wrongs are punishable by the state because they break the law. Okay. In contract law, where there are two or more parties who have antecedently agreed to stipulations and those stipulations are in some way abrogated by one party, then another may claim to have injury or harm as a result of that. But now when the tulip market collapsed in February of 1637, those investors who were left with unfulfilled contracts were unable to bring civil action against those buyers who refused to purchase tulips at the agreed-upon price on the grounds of breach of contract. They were not able to do that because the Dutch Parliament had decreed, as I just mentioned, right, that these contracts were to be interpreted as options, not promises. So the complaints of such investors therefore fell under the provisions of tort law. Now, to understand the dynamics and the dynamic interplay among Dutch politics, financial institutions, legal practices, and economic enterprise, all of which enabled the United Provinces to become the economic powerhouse of the Dutch Golden Age, we have to look further into the past. We have to look to the wars of independence from Catholic Spain. Now, the rise of the Dutch economy that reached its apex in the 17th century began a lot earlier as trading liaisons between southern and northern Europeans took to the high seas to transport durable goods and perishable foodstuffs along the coastline stretching from the Iberian Peninsula up into the lowlands bordering the North Sea. The Netherlands, both northern and southern, were, during the Renaissance, fiefdoms of the Holy Roman Empire. They were controlled by the House of Habsburg, whose Burgundian dukes held court in Brussels. Now, when Mary of Burgundy died in 1482, she left the Burgundian Low Countries to her son, Philip the Fair. He's sometimes nowadays called Philip the Handsome. Now, his son, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, took charge in 1506, and he decided that uh, with the point of many swords, he would manage to unite all these loosely connected fiefdoms into a substantial confederacy, and he did. And then in 1522, when he went to settle an inheritance treaty with his younger brother, the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, it has a name that reappears in history, Charles established the Spanish branch of the Habsburg dynasty. Thirty-four years later, consequent on his abdication, the 17 provinces composing the northern and southern Netherlands fell to the Spanish crown in the person of King Philip II, whose despotic rule and fanatical religious persecution sparked rebellion among the Dutch Protestants who were resident of the seven northern provinces. Now, this is known in, in, in Holland today as the Eighty Years' War. It was a revolution that eventually led to Dutch independence with the advent of a 12-year truce 
And they had this 12-year truce between the United Provinces and Spain. And that was, was something that was agreed to in 1609. Now, it began much earlier than that with this constant struggle. But the formation of the United Provinces, that's the, the, the northern provinces, the seven northern provinces, it was formally constituted as uniting them in as early as 1579. This is a very important year for the Dutch because that was the signing of what came to be called the Union of Utrecht. And the Union of Utrecht was effectively like a constitution. It established the basic fundamental rules that these seven uh, provinces would hold together as uh, constituting the way they would rule themselves. So it's a very important document in, uh, uh, in the history of, uh, of uh, the Dutch Republic. And it was in that document that the signatories from the seven northern low countries determined to rule themselves democratically. And in many respects, it's the first significant instance of the concerted effort to rule Right, people who had hitherto been under the rule of a monarch in a democratic fashion since the ancient Greeks. So it's a pretty striking moment in, in, in European history. Having hitherto been subject to imperial rule for generations, and more recently been the victims of the Spanish Inquisition and the vicious persecutions favored by Philip's inquisitors, the Dutch came to equate democracy with both political liberty and religious toleration. This was kind of a new idea. If we look at the Union of Utrecht, which you are free to look up later, if you look up Article 13, because in Article 13 the Dutch explicitly proclaimed, and here I'll quote from the document, every individual should remain free in his religion, and no man should be molested or questioned, interrogated, on the subject of divine worship. Right, so this was a fundamental right, right that the northern provinces put into play as they went to establish a democratic liberal state. Of course the Calvinists and the Anabaptists and the Lutherans and the other Protestant sects living in the northern lowlands, well they were not the only targets of the Spanish Inquisition, which had been established in 1478. Well, that's as far back as this goes, so we're looking way back into history there. It was established then in 1478, and the trials, which would have taken place in the motherland thenceforth, frequently and especially targeted the Sephardic Jewish community, indicting those who claimed conversion to Catholicism as false adherents to be convicted of the capital crime of Judaizing. This was a capital crime. Right? You would be put to death for the crime of Judaizing, which was just not being sincere in a conversion. And you could be interrogated, usually on the rack, right, in order to discover that indeed you were practicing the Jewish law. Well, on the 30th of March in 1492, when uh, Columbus was busy sailing the ocean blue for Spain, the Crown issued an edict requiring all practicing Jews to be expelled or sincerely to convert. Of course, imagine what they thought about the efforts to establish sincerity. Portugal, which was then under Spanish dominion, followed suit in 1497. And they denied the Sephardic Jews even the option of voluntary exile. And of course, what happened next was a continuous stream of refugees began departure from the Iberian Peninsula, often on or below decks of ships bearing trade between Spain and the Netherlands. And it was in the course of this diaspora that Spinoza's parents would come to Amsterdam in 1622, uh, ten years before his birth, and for his father to enter the Dutch mercantile class. Seven years later, the philosopher René Descartes, whose works would come to inspire the young Spinoza, also moved to Holland, similarly attracted to the democratic institutions, liberal sentiments, and religious toleration that marked the Dutch Republic as entirely unique among European nations of the early modern period. What was true in political theory was not altogether true in practice, however. With the Dutch Reformed Church and its Calvinist theologians having enough social dominance 
to influence the political realities of the day. An influence that grew in strength until it eventually fractured the fragile Dutch democracy of the 1670s, fueled in no small measure by the condemnation of Spinoza's treatise, and effectively permitting the House of Orange to dominate Dutch political life for decades to come. Nevertheless, between tulip mania and the assassination of the DeWitt brothers, who were the, John DeWitt was the grand pensionary, it was sort of like the president who was empowered to make executive decisions on behalf of the parliament and the states general and his brother. They were brutally assassinated on the steps of The Hague on the 20th of August, 1672. Well, between those periods, the United Provinces enjoyed the highest per capita income of any European nation. And the spirit of religious toleration during this period had as much to do with free enterprise as it did freedom of religion, because as long as trade was prosperous, sectarian difference could be overlooked. Right? It was, this was largely fueled by the House of Orange, complaining that the position of the Dutch in military in, 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 a, in a military conflict with the French was the fault of uh, idolaters and, and atheists, which we'll talk about in a moment. When Spinoza heard about the assassination of the DeWitt brothers, uh, he was living in the house of a painter, and uh, he lived upstairs in a garret there, a, 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 an attic, and he made himself a poster. Like, you might think posters, like, you know, out in protest were new things, but that, that they weren't. They was, this was there, too. And he wrote on this poster, Barbaros! Right? Barbarian! Right? And he wanted to go out in the street and protest this. And fortunately for us, his landlord, the, the, the painter, locked the door and wouldn't let him out. Because it's almost certain that he would also have been assassinated. He was well known, um, in, 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 you know, around, around that area. Okay, but this essential tension, right, which I, I think you can sort of start to see emerging between civil law, which is promulgated by rational agents contemplating demands for justice, and, and, and that would mean administering tort law, right, among the citizens of a free democratic society. The tension between that and divine law, which is intuited by prophets, enshrined in scripture, and promulgated by sectarian authorities, right, remained a prominent feature of political reality in 17th century Holland. And this tension between civil and divine law, well, this is nothing new in Western culture, right? We find the central worry in Plato's Euthyphro, right? And, and we also find it in the trial and death of Plato's illustrious teacher, Socrates. But in the Dutch experience, at least as Spinoza saw it, this tension is, I suggest to you, best understood as the tension between resolving civil disputes by appeal to the rule of law, on the one hand, and on the other, constraining the freedom to philosophize by appeal to the interpretation of Holy Writ. In a nutshell, the tension between torts and Torah. And so, I come to my last exhibit. Hereafter, I'll understand the term Torah to refer both to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, but also to the general idea of divine law, and Jewish law and ritual in particular. So I'll use it in a pretty broad sense. And here I will turn directly to Spinoza's treatise. He was certainly not the first philosopher to advance analogical, non-literal interpretations of Judeo-Christian scripture. St. Augustine and Maimonides uh, surely preceded him in both of the two uh, uh, sectarian divisions. He was, however, the first to present and to defend by rigorous historical argument the view that the Bible, especially the books that Christians call their Old Testament, is a work of literature, written and codified by men called prophets whose mental lives were guided by extraordinary imagination and not at all by rational intellect. Now at this point, I think I need to make two points of semantic clarification. One refers to the term God, and the other to the term religion. Now as regards the first, and not to put too fine a point on it, Spinoza was not an atheist. 
In fact, <laughs> at his most succinct, he writes in his masterwork, Ethica, simply, Deus sive natura, which literally translates God or nature. Right? And that doctrine identifies the referent of the word God, put that word in quotation, ask, well, what does that word refer to? He says it refers to the natural universe. And the notion of divine law is the notion of the law that expresses what we call nowadays the laws of nature, by which everything that happens follows by strict necessity. As regards religion, Spinoza sp supposes there are two flavors of religion, and he calls them quite simply true and false. Now, true, the, 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 the expression true religion comes to us from St. Augustine. It's a very old notion. Now, in Spinoza's view, true religion, right, he takes to be coextensive in its decrees with mature philosophy and consisting in but two imperatives. And these two imperatives you may find to, they're rather similar to something that you find in the books that the Christians call their New Testament. The first imperative, to love God by which he means to understand ourselves as parts of the natural order of things, not separated out from them. To love God is to understand ourselves as part of nature, because that's basically what another name for God is, nature. So when we understand ourselves well as a part of the natural order of things, and we do that by the sciences, we are engaged in loving God. Second, to manage our affairs ethically, by which he means to treat one another with charity and justice, and to seek resolution to torts in a manner that befits a modern democratic state. False religion, on the other hand, he takes to be the organized superstitions of sectarian communities. So let's go over this again. The organized superstitions of sectarian communities which are unified by received and unquestioned dogma, held together by the practice of various rites and rituals, and governed by hierarchical authority. So in Spinoza's view, false religion originates in abandoning the pursuit of science and the dictates of reason while embracing superstition instead. Now, he has a good deal to say about superstition in the treatise. And in his view, it originates in fear. It originates in fear before the vicissitudes of life. And like fortune itself, it's markedly inconstant. Right? We have this sense of right, the vicissitudes of life. They're very inconstant. In fact, sometimes they're rather difficult to understand. Consider what to make of the following injunction. Beware of superstition. It brings bad luck. Just think that over for a little bit. <laughs> okay, so there's this there's an inconstancy in, super, in superstitious beliefs. And quoting from the treatise now, Spinoza says, right, that that inconstancy Right, has been the cause of many terrible uprisings and wars. For the multitude has no rule more potent than superstition. So it is readily induced under the guise of religion now to worship its rulers as gods, and then again to curse and condemn them as mankind's common bane. And to counteract this unfortunate tendency, he continues, I'm still quoting from his text, immense efforts have been made to invest religion with such pomp and ceremony that it can sustain any shock and constantly evoke the deepest reverence in all of its worshipers. So they are the guardians of sectarian religion who engage in these immense efforts to induce and control superstition among people in the face of uncertainty. Like maybe the uncertainty of who will win the elections tomorrow. So you are all going to go out and vote if you haven't already, right? Now just say so. You humor me. Okay. Okay, so were these religious leaders given instead to the practice of true religion, Spinoza contends, and here I quote again from the treatise, 
They would not indulge in such arrogant ravings, but they would study to worship God more wisely and to surpass their fellows in love as they now do in hate. As I noted in my introduction, in the course of the 20 chapters composing the TTP, Spinoza is focused squarely on one overarching contention, that the single greatest threat to the peace and security of any civil society is sectarian religion. And the remainder of my talk today with you will be to survey the main lines of analysis, interpretation, and argument that led him to this striking conclusion about the relation between political sovereignty and ecclesiastical power. In his preface, Spinoza makes his target quite clear. The natural history of sectarian religion properly understood traces the social and political mechanisms whereby, in a philosopher and historian Stephen Nadler's words, quote, power-hungry ecclesiastics prey on the naivete of citizens taking advantage of their hopes and fears in the face of the vicissitudes of nature and the unpredictability of fortune to gain control over their beliefs and their daily lives. So that's from Stephen Nadler, who's the chair of the philosophy department at Madison, Wisconsin. A wonderful guy whose works are, 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 are very good. I, I certainly would recommend anything he's written. In any case, as Spinoza works his way through this natural history, he proposes to undermine the traditional pillars on which the claims of Judeo-Christian authorities depend. Prophecy, miracles, the election of Israel, and the notion that the Bible contains the unerring word of God. Now, I'll just say a little bit about each of these because I do want to try to make sure I leave time for some questions. Apropos the ancient prophets, Spinoza holds not only were they typically unlearned folk, but rather men of great charisma, gifted with strong and vivid imaginations, capable of inspiring their listeners to adopt various ethical precepts. Accordingly, prophets are to be regarded as enunciators of moral wisdom. This does not, however, in the least imply that the prophets acknowledged among the Abrahamic religions possessed much in the way of philosophical acumen, concerning the nature of God, the cosmos, the natural world, or concerning human nature, politics, and history. On the contrary, in sharp contrast to the towering figure of Maimonides, the 12th century rabbi, physician, and philosopher, with whom he was intimately familiar, Spinoza maintains in the treatise that philosophical understanding and religious conviction are completely incommensurable. This is especially pertinent as regards Spinoza's understanding of the sources of prophetic teaching, which amount to hearing voices, conversing with animals and angels, seeing wonders in the heavens and in the earth, the stuff of dreams and visions. Thus he concludes, and quoting again from the treatise, it was not a more perfect mind that was needed for the gift of prophecy, but a more lively imaginative faculty. End quote, than the minds and imaginations of ordinary folk. Now, apropos miracles, in Book 6 of the treatise, Spinoza argues that the very idea of a miracle as a divine interference in the normal operation of nature is incoherent. Extraordinary phenomena may indeed be marvels, but to take them for divine actions is a merely rank ignorance. This contention, of course, follows immediately from his fundamental principle, Deus Sive Natura, which says that the names God and nature are coextensive. This principle succinctly articulates the chain of reasoning he presents in Part 1 of Ethica, commonly referred to nowadays as culminating in the metaphysical doctrine of substance monism, which takes as its corollary that there are not, nor can there be, any supernatural facts because nature comprises and therefore exhausts all the facts there are, all the facts that have been, and all the facts that will ever be. Moreover, on Spinoza's view, the very idea of miracles is logically at odds with the idea of divine perfection. As he says, even if you wanted to reject the principle of Deus Sive Natura, supposing instead that the power of God, as expressed in religious language, and the power of nature, as expressed in scientific language, are distinct powers. The idea, in other words, that miracles do or even can occur, implies, and again quoting from the treatise, 
that God created nature so ineffective and prescribed for her laws and rules so barren that he is often constrained to come once more to her rescue if he wants her to be preserved and the course of events to be as he desires. This, Spinoza says, I consider to be utterly divorced from reason. Unlike David Hume, who in the 18th century would also criticize belief in miracles, Spinoza holds that miracles are not just improbable, they are on logical grounds metaphysically impossible. To believe in them is simply absurd. Now, apropos the so-called election of Israel, Spinoza maintains that insofar as the Jewish people experience periods of great prosperity, this had nothing to do with their being metaphysically, morally, or ethically special. Rather, the very idea that the Jews enjoyed a unique, divinely decreed vocation in world history has no purchase on historical fact, and derives rather from the achievement of well-ordered political institutions and simple good fortune. Apropos Holy Writ, as I noted earlier, Spinoza is concerned to show by way of close textual exegesis that the Bible is a work of imaginative literature. It contains nothing in the way of divine decree, on the one hand, but on the other hand, does contain the doctrinal seeds of true religion, ethical injunctions sufficient to inspire people to love one another as friends, to treat one another fairly and with kindness, generosity, and honesty. Moreover, the purport of this view extends to science and philosophy as well, especially as regards censorship and the freedom to philosophize. Thus, in chapter 14 of the treatise, he asserts, between faith and theology on the one side and philosophy on the other, there is no relation and no affinity. And in this, he echoes Galileo's earlier maxim, which was quite a bit prettier when he wrote to, uh, the, to uh, Christina, the Duchess of uh, uh, Florence in the day, the purpose of Scripture is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. So I'm bringing this around now to the last section of the talk about the rule of law and a few concluding remarks. So, so much for Spinoza's critique of sectarian religion in the TTP. But having undermined various historical claims of self-serving ecclesiastics to control the lives and beliefs of ordinary citizens, Spinoza is left with the philosophical task of advancing political theory towards understanding ourselves as rational agents, endowed with intellectual freedom, and with the power to enhance our prospects of enjoying flourishing community life. The main lines of his political philosophy follow those of his English predecessor, Thomas Hobbes, who twenty years earlier, before Spinoza's treatise saw the light of day, published The Leviathan, a work also branded as blasphemy by all manner of religious functionaries. The central thesis of part one of Hobbes's massive work is simple enough. The foundation upon which any civil society is built is agreement among people to accept the rule of a sovereign power. In Latin, Hobbes terms such, agreements, uh, such an agreement a pactum, and he supposes there are two species, pactum subjectionis, pactum unionis. Right, we'll talk a little bit more about them. In English, he calls them contracts. Now, in Hobbes's view, what motivates people to form social contracts, in other words, to promulgate civil societies, is most certainly not divine decree, nor is it, as Aristotle supposed, a simple derivation from the fact that humans are political by nature. By nature, we are appetitive, according to Hobbes. We seek what we take to be to our benefit and our advantage. And in the face of this, Hobbes contends that our reasoning tells us that just as surely as the sum of the interior angles of a triangle equals 180 degrees, we best secure our advantage by agreeing to the rule of a sovereign, for otherwise, with each left to his own or her own devices, our lives would be nothing but solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Spinoza's own treatment of the warrant for forming social contracts departs from Hobbes' historical fiction, depicting a war of all against all. Right, as constituting the human condition. Spinoza focuses instead on historical fact. On his account, as he says in the treatise, if men were so constituted by nature as to desire nothing but what is prescribed by true reason, society would stand in no need of laws. Nothing would be required but to teach men moral doctrine, and they would act to their true advantage of their own accord, wholeheartedly and freely. 
Both recent and ancient history, however, reveal enough injustice, oppression, perfidy, and deceit to demonstrate that people have long needed laws and that they must learn to reason well, for they are not naturally equipped to do so. So you might think about taking logic class sometime. Spinoza also departs from Hobbes as regards the form of social covenant that is best suited to human flourishing, where Hobbes wanted a pactum subjectionis, like the Magna Carta. Spinoza favored the pactum unionis, in short, democracy. In democracy, Spinoza reasons, the will of the community in which each person has voice is more likely to coincide with the will of the sovereign than in monarchies and oligarchies. So he asserts, and this is quoting from the treatise again, the most natural form of state, approaching most closely to that freedom which nature grants to every person. For in a democratic state, nobody transfers his natural right to another so completely that thereafter he or she is not to be consulted. That one transfers it to the majority of the entire community of which one is a part. In brief, Hobbes grounds his vision of the social contract in fear. Spinoza grounds his in hope. Hope for what? Hope for nothing short of equality and freedom. And I know we only have a few minutes, but it's rather important I get at this next little bit for you because of the context of the governor's theory and voting tomorrow. But here Spinoza also parts company with his exact contemporary John Locke, whose minimalist classical liberal state exists solely to protect the natural rights of its citizens to enjoy life, liberty, possessions, and health. Health, what a concept. Rather, Spinoza holds that it is the fundamental purpose of democracy to avoid the follies of appetite and to keep men within the bounds of reason as far as possible so that they may live in peace and harmony. All right, so he's, he's, he's making a point here that says this is the fundamental purpose, to keep us from the follies of our own appetites, and as much as possible to allow us to live within the bounds of reason so that we may live peacefully and harmoniously. Okay, I'm going to have to skip a little bit here so we can be sure we have at least some time for questions. Okay. So Spinoza's conception of the modern liberal state was not at all minimalist. It is, on his view, the primary responsibility of democratically constituted legislatures and executives and judiciaries to pursue the common good, the public welfare. So to return to my central concern today, right, his view is also at odds with the Jeffersonian adaptation of Locke's minimalist principles to the role of religion in political life. I assume we are all familiar with this adaptation through Jefferson's own phrase, a wall of separation between church and state. Now when Jefferson coined this phrase, writing to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802, 200 years after the institution of uh, the, uh, um, the Dutch East India Company, Jefferson was referring to the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Spinoza would not have endorsed this clause philosophically. And that is because while on the one hand, every citizen of a democracy in his view has, quote, the sovereign right and supreme authority to judge freely with respect to religion and consequently to explain it and to interpret it for himself, end quote, on the other hand, the liberal state, democratically constituted, because its primary responsibility is the public good, is further entrusted with the interpretation of religion. In other words, we're all free to believe as we wish, but in matters of public policy, of law, and of political action, the state, and the state alone, is sovereign. Anyone, Spinoza says, quoting again from the treatise, who seeks to deprive the sovereign of this authority over religion is attempting to divide the sovereignty. As a result, as happened long ago in the case of the kings and prophets of the Hebrews, there will inevitably arise strife and dissension that can never be allayed. You might also think of Palestine today or Northern Ireland, where we are still wondering if that dissension will ever be allayed. Again, Spinoza distinguishes between belief and action 
and expressions of religious doctrine that have, as he says, action that is implicit therein. These have to be subject to governmental control. There is consequently no greater threat to the maintenance of a peaceful society than to permit sectarian religion to challenge the authority of the state. For to allow such challenges is to divide the sovereignty. And in the commonwealth, this will spell nothing but its inevitable collapse. And so I leave you with the following concluding remark. In the same way that the just state must have the power to adjudicate torts and to regulate the sale of tulip futures, the just state must also have the power to regulate the role of religion in political affairs. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Dr. Bombardi? I know there isn't a whole lot of time before the bell's going to ring and you got to get off to other classes, but I'm happy to. Uh... Yes. Uh, what separates a sectarian religion from a non sectarian religion? Well, effectively, in his view, it's the distinction between cases in, in sectarian religion, there are dogmas which are held together by rituals and those rituals are administered by a hierarchical authority. It creates a sect which identifies itself as unique from others. When there is the practice of true religion, in his view, which I take in this case would be non-sectarian, right? it's, it's simply a commitment to these two great commandments. Right? To love God, right? that is to love nature, to see ourselves as part of nature, to study ourselves as uh, aspects of the natural world, and to treat each other with justice and fairness and not as the faithful against the infidel. That's a, kind of a mark of what sectarian religion has going, is to divide uh, sensibilities among people over which doctrines are true and which are not. Right? Which ones are handled by some scriptural authority that says these beliefs have to be uh, 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 practiced or they have to be understood as true. Uh, otherwise, then one falls outside the faith and one can be the object of persecution, as of course happened in, in, in the instance of Spanish rule over the Netherlands and certainly uh, over the Jews in the Iberian Peninsula. So effectively what he's thinking about as non-sectarian religion is the commitment of individuals to live in peace and harmony with one another, to practice the scientific disciplines, and to behave ethically and morally with respect to one another, to be friends. So, obviously in the modern age we've seen a rise of sort of ideologies as being, you know, sort of a, a very driving and divisive force in the same way religion has in previous centuries. What do you think Spinoza's response will be to things like the rise of communism during the 21st century, or 20th century, you know, as far as ideology becoming a competitor? Well, I suspect the first thing he would observe about that, if we could transplant him here, you know, would be to say, well, this is a form of political economy, All right? So. Uh, we, would, we would look at it in terms of the degree to which that form of economic distribution right, is something we would vote as a democratic institution as the best way for us to take the resources available to us, the labor that we have to commit to the earth, and uh, to, to you know, create conditions for a flourishing life. Um, and if we vote to live under, right, in, in a manner in which uh, we uh, own things in a communal fashion, then this would be a good thing. Um, if, if one wants to think of it ideologically, we could also just look at some relatively simple phenomena in which we have actually voted in that way. Uh, uh, a, a wonderful philosopher named David Swikert, who was here not too long ago doing a philosophy lecture uh, in our Lyceum series, uh, who may be coming back soon, had a lovely example in which he said, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we all sort of decided by voting together, right, by having a democratic institution that said, we should just have one sewer system. It's really better for us all, right? So let's have a sewer system that's communal, right? Let's deliver the water communally and let's relieve us of our waste communally instead of all of us having to dig our own outhouses. This is a better way of life. So that's a case where we've decided democratically to, uh, to pursue a principle of communal life. That would be something you would have to decide. Right? The fact that it's ideological has to do with, well, how do you want to live your life? 
and that's something for the public good to decide, what's best for the public good. Well, what I mean to say is not specifically like socialism as a uh, governmental uh, institution, but um, example of the Russian Revolution where you have a communist uh, ideological group that then can think of, um, became competitive with the actual governmental authority and sought to overthrow it and challenge it as sovereign authority. And you see that in other countries. And this idea of the war of ideologies for sovereign power instead of religion versus the state. Well, these would be insurrections that would be also attempting to divide the sovereignty of the state from its institution as a democracy. So he's only thinking in his political theory that the best form of state is a democratic one. If one you know, engages in military action or economic action or propaganda right, that seeks to undermine the democratic will of the population, then that would be an insurrection and it should be put down. Um, so, in your analysis, if a group of people, a society or a country, uh, voted democratically to restructure their government around some form of sectarian religion, would you consider that decision to be democratic, peaceful, and permissible, or not? Well, if the <laughs> one of the things that Spinoza sort of suspects is that uh, a, an educated, rational cooperation among a lot of individuals, like a fairly substantial state, it would be very unlikely that it would come up with the idea that one sect should dominate over another one. But if it did, um, and, and you created a kind of theocracy, his view would be this was a case where, I think he would see it this way, uh, one engaged in a democratic process in which one surrendered one's freedom to continue to, um, continue to behave in a democratic liberal fashion and to accept the rule of, of a hierarchy. So it's possible to do that, right? But then what you would be doing would be trading away your democracy for a theocracy. You know what I'm saying there? If you decided to do that, you could do that by, your, by the political will of the group and say, we don't want that political will anymore. We don't want the freedom to make decisions and to regard our ethical and moral responsibilities as rational agents. We want this sectarian religion or that sectarian religion because sectarian means you've got a sect, right? And it has a very particular set of dogmas. And those dogmas are enshrined in rites and rituals. If you don't practice them, you're outside the sect. So if we were to say, well, we are going to get together and we're going to vote, and our, our decision is that we will all become, I don't know, sectarian members of the flying spaghetti monster religion or any other one that you might choose, at that point, we would be abrogating democracy and choosing a different kind of rule. So in your analysis, you can, it is reasonable to say that exercising democracy is also an abandonment of it. Is also to the advantage of others? No, is no, also an abandonment of democracy. To vote democratically, to leave democracy as a form of government behind would be inconsistent with democratic principles? Well, I think in this case, he would probably be likely to say, this is a decision, this is something that divides the kind of view that Hobbes had, where you would, when, when you decide you're going to have to have a sovereign, because the beginning of the state is that decision. The beginning of, of forming a civil society, in both of their views, is always that we don't see ourselves as well advantaged unless we accept the rule of a sovereign. Now for Hobbes, what you do is you, you get a monarch, effectively. And then the monarch Pretty much in those instances, once you've accepted the rule of that monarch, the monarch gives you state religion. It says, this is your religion, kid, because it's what the monarch dictates. Spinoza's view was that we should practice the freedom to, to have religious beliefs and let democracy, the rule of the whole, might be uh, uh, something that is an ongoing practice rather than surrendering it to a sovereign. Now, that could be the pope. It could be the archbishop of Canterbury. It could be a caliphate. But any, any effort to do that would be to surrender one form of, of uh, social contract, right, which would be the pactum unionis. The pact is us, and we have to keep doing it. We have to renew it all the time, constantly have to renew that, which is one of the reasons we hope you'll all go vote tomorrow. Because that's what you would be doing, is practicing democracy, rather than just going, we'll just have rulers, I vote for, let put somebody else in charge. I don't want to be. More questions down front. Thank you. Thank you very much.